Hi, Mark. Hi, Elias. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you. We are witnessing colossal societal change. Technology is rewriting the social contract between people and governments and companies, and investors are under huge scrutiny. Generating profits is no longer enough. Let me start with you, Elias. How are investors' expectations on companies changing globally and in Africa? It, it depends on which investor you're talking about. If you're talk, uh, talking about an investor that has gone through a diligent process of introducing ESG in their decision-making process, you get one set of expectations. If you talk to an investor that is still skeptical about ESG, it's a different set of expectations. And then you get what I call the modern investor, which has gone beyond ESG and is already thinking about impact. And the psychology of this new investor is very different to the first two. Their objective is first and foremost to change the environment in which they operate so as to secure their returns for a very long time, at least two generations. The first two set of investors tend to be a shorter outlook investor than the impact investor. And the one that hasn't thought about ESG tends to be short term, maximizing profits at all costs. So that is the different, those are the different perspectives that you get depending on which investor you're talking about or you're talking to. Mark, let me bring you in. Your relationship with governments and communities is fundamental to Anglo-American success. However, new times, new aspirations. Do you feel different pressure from society and investors? What I would say is I think the relationship and the type of relationships are changing. Um, in an Anglo-American context, I think in the early days, the relationship was somewhat paternalistic. And uh, depending on the jurisdiction and the maturity of government and the infrastructure, um, it did in some part shape the relationship. But I think as we go forward, uh, we, ha we have to do a better job explaining where mining fits in society in its broader sense, and for those that sort of follow our industry, understanding that we drive 45% of the world's economy um, at least establishes why we're there. The people that uh, pay the biggest price for our activities and, and are impacted, whether it be physically in terms of the footprint or in other uh, ways, uh, are our local communities. So. To be successful, I think we have to move away from an old paternalistic model to one of partnerships, whether that's at the local community level. Uh, we need to be a partner in, in building infrastructure that works for the broader community. We have to be part of that community and we have to be part of their future and at the same time do our part and make sure that we're working with regional governments, we've got our regional collaboration model, or with federal governments in terms of uh, helping them deliver on their, pro their priorities to the country as a whole and getting that balance right and making sure the relationship is one of a partnership as opposed to the old style paternalism, I think is really important in terms of what we're looking at today and for the future. And with that point, let's talk specifically to today's topic, impact investment. This is a powerful concept resulting from these renewed expectations. And put simply, these are investments that aim to balance commercial returns with explicit societal benefits. As such, it goes much beyond pure philanthropy or traditional CSR. Mm. Elias, let me turn first to you. Uh, there has been a growing mobilization of capital for social and environmental causes. But where is this money coming from? It's interesting that the money is coming from private hands. It's coming from pension funds. It, come, it comes from uh, family funds. It also comes from sovereign wealth funds. But what is common with all the people that are involved in impact investing is that they are not doing it for charity. 
they are doing it to make a return. But the key difference between the current investor or the impact investor with any other investor is the sequencing with which they make their decisions. The traditional investor will walk into the boardroom with two questions. How do you maximize profit? And as we maximize profit, how do you look after ESG? The impact investor goes beyond ESG and reorders the same questions and says, what is the change that I want to bring about in the environment in which I operate? so that I remain in business, I continue to make profits, not maximize profits, but optimize my profits over a long period of time. So in their mind, they are, they are avoiding booms and busts, as well as creating a good working environment with the people that they work with, employers, clients, and other stakeholders. So in their mind, they are saying if they don't do it, the sustainability of their profits is going to be compromised. But we want one guarantee from governments. Provide the right investment environment for us to operate in a predictable fashion and are able to optimize our returns or minimize our risks as we deem fit. So that contract is a very important contract going forward and escalated with COVID. So COVID has just forced a collaboration between private sector and governments. It has also forced private sector to realize that they can no longer wait on governments to change the future for them. They have to step up and change the environment in which they operate in order to secure the, the capital or the assets that they've accumulated. If they do not, the likelihood is all that capital that they are trying to protect is likely to go up in smoke. That, that is what impact investing is about. Mm. Let me be a bit inquisitive here, Elias. In a way, are these initiatives not allowing profit-driven companies to dodge their CSR responsibilities? Can I, can I position the question differently and say, would the growth of the impact investing initiative give comfort to those investors that are not even ready to do ESG? And the answer to that question is yes and no. Yes, in the sense that if somebody else is already doing the right thing and they've taken the risk, they've invested, and nobody is applying pressure on me to do the right thing, I can continue doing business the way I was doing all along because there's no penalty. Where else in an environment outside of impact in ESG or pre-ESG, there's usually rules that guide the way you operate. There's usually oversight that comes with that. And some either moral suasive interventions or penalties that come with it. But with impact investing, none of that exists. The impact investor does not wait for government to come up with the rules or incentives. They do it because by its own right, impact investing is an incentive to stay in business. Mark, Elias raised some very interesting points here and uh, feel free to comment on that. Here is my question to you though. Um, mining companies have often supported communities directly with education, health, infrastructure, etc. Is impact investment something fundamentally different or is it CSR by another name? It, it's both. Um, first point I would make is that I think Elias has, has hit the issues very well, so I couldn't articulate them any better. So I won't repeat them. I think they are absolutely right. But what I would say is in terms of philanthropy, we do that work. 
But what we believe is the, the greater legacy that we provide is, for example, in investing in infrastructure, and I mean critical infrastructure that supports long-term, uh, if you like, diversification of the commercial base of many of the communities in which we operate, provides them with a future beyond the life of mine. Now, in our case, and if I put a number to it, it might mean 10, 15, maybe even 20% more in our investment in a particular project, but making sure that our capital investments are helping the communities with, for example, access to water. And I'll give an example in Peru, where at Kivec, uh, our investment in water structure storage turned a six-month agricultural season into a 12-month agricultural season for those communities, totally changing the commercial basis of that community. Now, that was one of the things we agreed that they saw as a priority. Now, for us, that's impact investment. It costs something. But from our point of view, to have the community establish a totally revised and upgraded commercial base is good for us as well because it brings more services, more support into the community. And so it, it, it's a good outcome for both of us. And so in reality, we get a return and the community gets a significant return. And the government's happy with that as well because it also then supports education and other infrastructure. And it's not confined to water. It's a number of projects that we've done with our local communities in those new projects it have been very different. And they've been driven by the community's needs, not what we think they need. So I move on from this uh, paternalistic model to one of partnerships where a company in building a mine or investing in uh, infrastructure in a community starts with a question, which is simply, we are part of the community. We ask the community what that, what the future they want to see for their community and then try and understand where we can invest consistent with developing our operations whereby the investments deliver them a long-term return. And when we talk about philanthropy versus impact investing, in my view, impact investing is more sustainable because it sustains you through cycles. In philanthropy, companies, individuals, in many cases, can't support those types of investments in down cycles, whereas impact investing delivers a return through the cycle, and by definition, it's far more sustainable, it's more focused, it tends to be more focused on what the community wants as opposed to what the benefactor thinks the community wants, and I think it is a far more virtuous model and certainly longer-term sustainable, consistent with all of the things that Elias defined uh, that we should be looking for from that type of investment. May I stretch that concept just a little bit? This, I'm going to use the South African context as an example or as a backdrop. I think over time, economics is being rewritten. What we've always understood as a separation between social goods on the one side and economic goods on the other is becoming almost fused. These are becoming almost the same goods. So what that means is, a company that previously only focused on its infrastructure to operate and left everything else to the state, the state would provide security, water, electricity, roads, harbors, and everything else. So the only thing that the investor would be concerned with is, is the shell within which they operate. But in our context, it has become almost second nature to invest in energy provision because the local or the national power producer has underperformed consistently over time. You can say the same with health. You can say the same with education. You can say the same with water. You can say the same with road infrastructure. So because of that fusion of the two categories of goods, it becomes very difficult for me 
to define anything as philanthropic for the simple reason that a lot of the services that are required by a producer can no longer be seen purely as commodity or as goods that need to be provided by the state. In many cases, they have become part and parcel of the bottom line. Mark, any comments? No, I think I think that's absolutely right. I think the way we go about our work, it really is about understanding community needs. We, we of course, we talk to the government. Of course, we talk to the regional governments. Of course, we talk to the community, and then work out where we can invest. Certainly, to to ensure that we've got a sustainable business. But we go beyond that, clearly, to 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 build that partnership. And we invest in the infrastructure or extend the investment in our infrastructure to support the longer term needs of the community. Because when you look at a mine, we might have a a 20 year resource, a 30 year resource, but beyond the life of the mine, the community must continue on. And so the real question about did we make a sustainable difference to that community is quite often around the infrastructure we create with the community that is used beyond the mine gate for a whole range of other activities. So we're the catalyst to bring new capital in. What we're trying to do is be a catalyst for additional capital and extensions to capital that provides that community with a new commercial base that goes well beyond the life of the mine and can we leave infrastructure that the community can use for other commercial activities that are developed during the life of the mine. And that, that includes bringing skills, as uh, Elias talked about, human capital. It's about financial capital. It's about expertise and what we do. It's all of those dimensions. I think he's absolutely right. Mark, let me, though, play the devil's advocate here. Is this approach not pushing the cost from miners onto other investors and the communities? Well, no, it's the opposite. What I'm saying is that we are investing in mines and extending our investments beyond the mine gate into community projects where the community has identified those projects as being the ones that they would like us to support them or help them with. So as I said, it's not about simply investments inside the mine gate. And that's that's the point I'm making. We invest in the business we invest in the community and we can see where there are connections where we, our investments beyond the mine gate are about connecting ourselves with the community and providing them with additional infrastructure to build new commercial activities that go beyond the mine. There are new in terms of that community. So give me, I'll let you, I'll, I will give you an example. Where a community is substantially agricultural based, The provision of roads and transport infrastructure, the provision of water and other support services and energy can turn subsistence agriculture into commercial agriculture and provide a route to market, a a, a, um, competitive route to market that they would not otherwise not have. So we think about, okay, what can we invest in beyond the mine gate on infrastructure that would also support the community building that agricultural sector in that community, turning that into a real commercial venture. Elias, you work with impact investors across all sectors. Um, Is mining ahead or behind the curve in this respect, would you say? Very, Very difficult to say. And I think Mark would have to answer that question. I cannot answer on behalf of mining or nor can I answer on behalf of the incumbents in mining. This is simply because impact investing is a belief. It requires a set of beliefs for you to do it and do it right. It is not like ESG where you have boxes that you have to tick and say you qualify as an ESG player. Now, what mines do is very akin to what is expected of an ESG player and also very much reflective of what regulations may require. But by nature, mine investments 
go into an area where typically there is nothing. They create a business and they bring agglomeration to that area. Now, whether they do that willingly or they do it because regulation requires them to do it, I cannot know that. Mark can be able to tell us that. Let me pass that on to Mark then. I, I think uh, it would be utopian for me to say that the mining industry uh, as a collective is, is in the impacting investing space. We're not. Um, the way Elias describes the importance and, and the focus, I think he's right. And I think you would have to look each, at each company and there are many different philosophies. If I can say from an Anglo-American perspective, I think we've been in all of those spaces where there are in the history areas where we've just invested in the mine. I think there are examples of where we've invested right across the community and all of the examples in between. But what we've said in our sustainability strategy that we went public with in 2017 is that the total package is what we're about. It's about partnerships with communities, the, the development partner approach, the regional collaborative development. Mining operations, as I said, drive around 45% of the world's economy. That's 10% in terms of um, direct revenue from commodities. 10% goes to services and supplies. And then 25% is the contribution, the goods that we produce, driving energy, construction, infrastructure, uh, agriculture, fertilizers, for example, double agricultural productivity, everything. We touch everything. We take up half a percent of the global land space in developing our operations. So generally, we have material impacts on 1%, 1 to 2% of the communities around the world. They pay the biggest price for having us next door. If we as a mining company don't look after those communities and help develop a broader infrastructure base for their future, I don't think we've got a future. Second, if we're not making a contribution to the regional fiscus and making a difference regionally, they're not going to want us there. And then federally, if we're not making a contribution to the federal fiscus and making the country a better place, we don't have the future. We're more now, in our heads, a, a metals and minerals company. Longer term, we'll be a material solutions company because we're going to recycle products to give to our customers. We've got to think about how we're carbon neutral by 2040. We've got to look at using far less water. There's a whole range of things we've got to do. And more than anything, if we don't make a contribution to those local communities, they won't want us. So we have to think broadly about the contribution we make to society and we have to tick every one of those boxes. Go ahead. May, may I just ask Mark to give us a piece of statistic? And this, this is what I would call my litmus test. And my litmus test is about when you are an impact player, you take a long-term view. When you are a miner, you take a long-term view. And in my mind, taking a long-term view is taking a long-term view beyond the existence of the mine, right? A, the litmus test question for me is, Mark, can you give us an indication of the record of mine rehabilitation after a mine shuts down? In South Africa, you don't have to talk about other parts of the world. I think in the South African context would be a nice uh, area to look at. Do we have a good record of mine rehabilitation? I think as an industry, it's a very mixed record. What we've done today is we now try and progressively rehabilitate as we mine, but we're actually doing it very differently. There is a, if I could uh, maybe direct your listeners to a book, and uh, it's around the Eden Project, and it's called 101 Things You Can Do With a Hole in the Ground. And it talks about developing a closure plan from the start of the life of the mine. And that's where we start. When we start with the mine, we already have 
a closure plan. Now, we develop and improve the closure plan, but the closure plan is based on what would the community do with what we leave behind? And in many cases, instead of taking the energy plant away or the workshops or all of the infrastructure, in many cases, the community say, no, 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 leave us with infrastructure that's still operating because there are so many different things we can use that infrastructure for. Or create landforms, if you're in an open cut, that we could use for terraced agriculture or water harvesting. So... If I answered Elliot's question, I think in the past, not a good job. I think the thinking is changing quite radically. Now, every one of our minds now has a life of mind plan and a rehabilitation strategy for closure that is now starting to link with what the community is looking for. So I think we're in transition. I think we're getting better, but we've still got a long way to go. And I, I think it's a really important piece of work and it's the right question. Good. Then before we conclude, let's look to the future. And Elias, I'm going to start with you. Um, this ap approach requires new partnerships and strategic alliances. From your experience in other sectors, uh, how can you make this happen? Very, very difficult to say. One of the biggest criticisms that we have in South Africa is since 1994, we've been trying to establish what we call a social compact. And a social compact is where every economic player gets involved in decision making, owns that decision. To this day, we don't have it. And a lot of people seem to argue that the pandemic has brought misery only. I think it has brought opportunities as well. For the first time, was seeing a high level of collaboration between private sector and government, something that has never happened before in the post-1994 history in South Africa. And this, for me, is a huge dividend from the pandemic that we need to capitalize on. Secondly, for the very first time, organized business in South Africa has taken it upon itself to drive the economic turnaround. It is acknowledged that government no longer has the ability to use fiscal capital to turn around, to intervene in the economy, let alone turn around, turn it around. So business has said, we are going to take that leadership responsibility. We'll go and raise the capital from anywhere and we'll take the liability for that capital, not government. We will identify the critical infrastructure investments. All that we want from government is partnership. It's happening, but it's unfortunate that it is a collaboration that is forced, that has originated out of a crisis. I would turn around and ask the question, why didn't we do it all along? we probably would have managed or handled the pandemic much better had we started collaborating 10 years ago instead of trying to collaborate now five, five months ago because you want to resolve a common crisis. Mark, let me leave the final remarks with you. The coming wave of mining technologies, the so-called mining 4.0, hinges on the promise of higher productivity but many people fear a reduction of direct benefits like jobs. How will the mine of the future secure the, its social license to operate and what role will impact investment play in this? Look, I, th I think, uh, firstly, uh, public policy is very important. And Ellis talked about the, the development strategy for South Africa and our concern, I think the strategy was actually very good, but the execution of the strategy and the changing of policy frameworks wasn't material enough to change behaviours. Now, Elias rightly points out business has got to stand up and put its point forward and give structure and debate those policy frameworks. And I think we've got to be far more active, and I think he's right. In our case, what we would say is that, for example, the land debate in South Africa in my view, as an opportunity because, as the President says, we've got the land. What we need to do is get infrastructure to the land. 
and develop it. So we've got a development issue. So as a company, we can provide land and we can support on the development of infrastructure, which I think actually solves the land issue as a conversation. If I take that further and we look at the changes we're making, putting solar arrays in to generate um, energy and then convert, use the excess capacity to convert into hydrogen and then put hydrogen into trucks, that's the new economy, that's the new mining industry that can be used to actually help with the non-carbon side of the economy. The third point is as we automate, then ultimately there are probably less jobs direct in the industry. But then what we've done in our sustainability plan is we've said it's up to us to be a catalyst for the creation of five jobs for every job that we have on site. So if you go back to my first two points, that's how we can be a catalyst to help create five jobs off-site in those communities and then that becomes a self-fulfilling economic development strategy for the country that connects with the big planning strategy that South Africa put to forth. So we've got to play our part. So I think Elias is connecting the right dots, but industry has to play its part, and we're trying to work out how we do that in a constructive way. Mark, Elias, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. Our pleasure too. Good seeing you, Elias. Thanks, Mark. Cheers.